A history is sparse, detailed, sometimes not quite in order. Occasional platitudes, names and more names like sumptuous morsels that retell however modest and accurate past. But a legacy is to die beautifully, like Hedda Gabler. Beauty controlled and apparent to all, like the marriage of the Virgin in the Brera. Spectres that haunt their own vestiges, when permitted maybe once every thousand years to perfect their existence with violent gestures too subtle for the living to notice. Like the Madonna of Foligno or the portraits of Doni, what archive or archaeological discovery can render true that invisible life of common people? None but certain art forms which present without effort a record of human desire. The flat roof is an important element in the aesthetic of reinforced concrete architecture and is a novel advantage so that the roof of a theater can become a public square. But the spy scare of the First World War touched all expression of public life so that the flat roof of every factory was regarded as a gun emplacement. In an effort to escape ugliness and unhappiness, rich men often intensify both. But the war, nonetheless, purged Europe of this, of confusing luxury with extravagance, of architecture stricken with as much ornament as it could physically support. The density of concrete is the index to its strength and impermeability. Maximum density is to be obtained by using aggregate and sand, each with particles of varied and well-graded sizes, so that the voids or spaces between the largest pieces of aggregate are occupied by stones of the next largest size and thereafter by particles of progressively decreasing dimensions until the spaces remaining to be filled are small enough to give the sand or other fine material the opportunity of continuing the process to a stage where the cement and water occupy all the spaces which remain. The Romans, Pliny and Vitruvius, their voice, established a universal construction method and developed concrete from a crude filling into a structural material. They achieved perfection. But with the collapse of the empire, concrete construction disappeared, its secrets lost. Modern concrete evolved from pisse or mud. Pisse shapes were molded by packing the soft earth between removable timber formwork. Very soon, Francois Quintero and others would replace mud with strong concrete. Modern concrete became combined with iron or steel, a strange material unbeknownst to man materialized, monolithic and jointless, and strength suddenly became a function from its shape and not its mass, stability by tension instead of dead weight. A fearless contractor named Francois Cognier perfected the new material through progressive experiments. He built the station master's house at Serenes off the Versailles Railway and a house in the Rue de Poissonnier at Saint-Denis. The rich seldom built their mansions of anything but finely worked stone, and it was an ingrained conviction that ashlar was the only respectable material for construction. Concrete suffers from always having been regarded as a cheap material, with the result that any suggestion of treating it in a seemly manner as a material worthy of architectural recognition was regarded not only as an extravagance, but as an actual misuse. Cheapness is never in itself something to be ashamed of, since most architectural forms throughout the course of history have been conditioned, if not evolved, through a search for economy of either material or effort. From the beginning of Louis XVI's reign, we can find the use of stuccoed rubble elaborately treated to simulate masonry, whereby fashionable architects sought to emulate for their less wealthy clients the golden splendor of earlier reigns. Revivalism in religion and reforms in political and social life naturally had their effect on every expression of Victorian thought, and on no form of art more thoroughly than on architecture, which must always be most affected by changing social patterns. For those in England who speculated about the nature of a new architecture or a new architectural material, therefore, the problem tended to be primarily ethical, and it was no surprise that their leader should be John Ruskin, a man obsessed with the awareness of sin and whose impassioned oratory seldom enunciated an architectural doctrine without evoking the ethereal heavens. 
The limitlessness that concrete offered by its plastic form could not be enjoyed by a good Victorian who would not disregard the unprincipled character of its fabrication. It was difficult to escape from the conclusion that a proper architect would eschew the material altogether because according to Ruskin, any methods used by the Romans were an anathema in association with sacrilegious idol worship. The aesthetics of potentialities says that a material approximates to perfection in proportion to the number of possibilities it presents. Is Francis Onderdonk saying that plasticity, boundlessness, limitlessness, what a great poet once described as the ever-changing constellation of perpetual danger, is this perfection or the absolute means to a perfect end? Due to its plasticity before setting, concrete, Onderdonk writes, can adopt any conceivable form. The more a material can be affected by mechanical and chemical influences while being formed, the more possibilities it contains, and hence the more perfect it is. Is plasticity chaos? Is plasticity perfection? Does plasticity have a tendency for perfection? Is plasticity and its potential to chaos necessary for the potential to perfection? Familiarity often leads to the acceptance of execrable things. If there is no wise protest like the adroit cry of CFA Voisey, who pleaded a break from all forms of imitation, steeped in archaeology, and superimposed surfaces of quite another nature, the covering of brick or glazed tiles for the preservation of our innate conservatism. John Ruskin ruled that no material was to be made to look like another material, and although the theorists had not the slightest idea as to what concrete should look like, they were quick to condemn any parlor architect who made it look like anything recognizable. Passionate engineers who delighted in large displays of the interminable potentialities of concrete, especially if they produced shapes unseen on earth, overestimated the potency of what Le Corbusier termed the engineer aesthetic, and stimulated by a very human lust to astound, and by the intellectual pleasure derived from elaborating mathematical formulae, designed abstract shapes which expressed physical science at the expense of logical construction. The early practitioners could not create a coherent architecture because the early theorists had filled their minds with the notion that an aesthetic will be found on the theorem that concrete is capable of any form. They ignored the fundamental antithesis essential in concrete design, namely that although the plasticity of concrete is by its nature unlimited, this limitlessness is in fact restricted by the practical limitations of the molds in which concrete is poured. There are two methods whereby a mold is created, and the distinction between these two methods is the sole indication of an ethical boundary between the original and the imitative in concrete design. The first method requires a negative mold cast in plaster or glue to be created from a positive mold of an alien material such as clay, and when the negative mold is emptied, the concrete is poured in to become an exact copy, an imitation of the positive mold which had been modeled beforehand. The second method requires a mold constructed in wood or metal according to architectural drawings. No duplication is required of the concrete as it fills the mold. The mold formwork is the original artwork, genuine, like an engraving or an intaglio that achieves fulfillment when transposed onto concrete in reverse, creating the positive original, an unimitative result which directly expresses purpose and directly expresses design. Concrete becomes a material that intrinsically displays one's decision to create structures of lasting beauty by the suppression of its plasticity and potential for chaos. We direct our efforts, our decisions, to the binding of possibilities, which is the fulfillment of Francis Onderdong's perfection the recognition of that which is already in effect and can most naturally and seamlessly limit, thus giving form to human volition. Structure is itself the ornament, its members left simple and lucid as to their importance, and its shape is a direct result of timber molds, which necessitate a trabeated process of horizontal beam and lintel where arch has no meaning. Variety and delight, like playful children in a garden, 
can find expression through the proportions of openings and the play of plane surfaces in contrast with the structural elements. If the structure is not worthy to remain visible, unsheathed and naked, then the architect has failed at his task. For the classical architect, whether he be a first century Roman or an 18th century Frenchman, a wall is a frame with a non-load-bearing infilling. Style is determined by the economical use of material. Economy is not plainness and cheapness, nor is it the substitution of plaster and tinsel to achieve the effect of marble and gold. It is a virtue that maximum effort shall be obtained by minimum means. This effortlessness underlies the whole medievalist doctrine as interpreted by Violet Le Dieu. Ruskin says that architecture must be carefully distinguished from building. He is wrong. An architectural development upon settled principles waits upon the honest and direct expression of constructive purposes and force. Reinforced concrete design is a result of executional methods, an awareness of construction acknowledged in the concluding aesthetic. A good architect has acumen in the processes of construction. Let construction and design be bound together. Allow them to create one another.